In Indic history, this process wherein the institutionalized nodes of freedom and happiness that were the by now solidly established mendicant and monastic institutions were able to transmit the vision of a positive and fulfilling human life reality into the larger lay communities. This affected the larger society, inspiring the process where the harsh and dominating Vedist gods tending toward one form or another, Brahma, Shiva, Vishnu, of the great creator Maha Ishvara, gave way to the divine Bodhisattva, the loving, kindly, caring god, Avalokita Ishvara. At the same time, many mother goddesses emerged. Prajna Paramita, the transcendently wise mother of Buddha's goddess, Tara, the savior goddess, Saraswati, the artist goddess, etc. They graciously provided new models of both divinity and the nonviolent caring kingship already exemplified on the basis of the individual vehicle by the great Emperor Ashoka, as we talked about in previous sections. Far from competing with Hinduism, the rise of the universal vehicle influenced the larger Indic culture enormously as the popular devotionalist or bhakti movement in Hinduism began to transform the austere Vedist gods, focusing on the more monotheistic forms, as I've already mentioned, and along with the Hindu versions of the goddesses Saraswati, Tara, and Uma, the Great Mother, etc. Western and westernized Asian historians have this influence backward as they first encountered Indic Buddhism only in the 19th century, and only as the 19th century individual vehicle orthodox version in Sri Lanka. Thus, they think that the devotional movement rose from some sort of non-Vedist grassroots, nobody really knows where, and became widely, po widely popular, and the Buddhist monks became out of touch and wildly unpopular, and the, so the monks then forged up a bunch of universal vehicle sutras and made the whole thing up in order to compete with the Hindu devotional theistic movements, sort of making Buddha into a god to compete with the Hindus. So they call the individual vehicle discourses or suttas, etc., early Buddhism, and the universal vehicle late Buddhism, even though there is no single bit of physical or textual evidence whatsoever until centuries later for either of the vehicles for that matter. By then, because in India people memorized things and religious things were not thought to be written down, that was for merchants to write them down. And so they kept them without writing text and then texts disappear in the Indian climate and have to be recopied every few centuries or every century. So there's no evidence until fourth, fifth century of the common era. By then, both had coexisted for centuries, even in Sri Lanka, both vehicles thriving there as well in combination up until the 10th century, when Buddhism was basically wiped out in India. And at that point in Sri Lanka, an individual vehicle monastery wiped out a universal vehicle monastery during a competition between princes for the throne each monastery backing a prince, in other words, and the winning monastery proclaimed the exclusivist version of, of the individual vehicle as the new orthodoxy. This version was what the British encountered in the 19th century during their search to account for the unexplained vast numbers of Buddhist ruins they dug up all over India when supposedly Buddhism had disappeared and hardly ever existed in India. They were there, the Brahmins were telling them. So now you'll all be looking into this debate in your readings, but there are some basic arguments to consider for the new historical view I propose in this lecture. One, the Bodhisattva concept was already taught in the individual vehicle, so it didn't have to be made anew, just had to be applied to everyone. Two, the love and compassion contemplations, the immeasurable love and immeasurable compassion, were basic to the meditative fields, essential to achieving even the enlightenment of the arhat saint, the individual vehicle ideal. Three, 
After Ashoka, with some back and forth, the Buddhist monument and monasteries for public gathering and pilgrimage were well established throughout the subcontinent, which would not have been the case if the monks and nuns were becoming so madly unpopular. Four, the individual vehicle, quote, early, unquote, Buddhists were not at all atheistic, as the Vedas gods such as Indra and even the more monotheistic Hindu gods such as Brahma were very much in evidence in Buddhist discourses in Pali. Of course, the Buddha relativized them all and refuted the possibility of any of them being omniscient or omnipotent, with the Indic gods actually looking to the Buddha for omniscient explanations. Though Buddha does not present himself as being either omnipotent or, but only what I call omnicompetent in both individual vehicle and universal vehicle discourses, the discipline literature and in the scientific literature.